The Wolf Dog by Walt Morey. Chapter 3 Andy Evans was up before daylight. He tiptoed about the kitchen, getting his own breakfast and putting up a lunch. This was Saturday, and he had to run his trap line. He hadn't run it since before the blizzard, and it was going to be a rough all-day job after that storm. He needed, it. he needed an early start. This was his second year running the line. Last year he'd made almost $500. He hoped to do as well this season. Breakfast was over. He closed the damper on the stove. He stacked the dishes in the sink, got his bottle of matches and shells from the cupboard, and slipped on his parka. He took his rifle and belt axe from behind the door and was ready to go. Before he left, Andy tiptoed to the bedroom door and listened. Normally his father and mother slept late Saturday and Sunday mornings. His father was watchman at the Hunter Point, Hunter's Point Cannery, and in winter there was little to do. This morning, he heard his father stirring about. Ever since Smiley Johnson's plane had been lost, his father had been rising early and spending all day at the cannery's shortwave radio, keeping in check with the six bush pilots who were combing the country, searching for the downed plane. Andrew, sorry, Andy quietly left, let himself out the kitchen door, took down his pack sack, stuffed his lunch inside, and slipped the straps over his shoulders. He stepped into the snowshoes and headed off through the deep snow toward the distant valley and his trap line. Fifty yards from the house, he stopped and loaded the rifle. Andy Evans was fifteen. He was rather thin and bony, with brown hair and a scattered scattering of pale freckles across his face. His heavy-boned frame held the promise of a big man. After he had loaded the rifle, he stood a moment, looking at the night scene spread out behind below him. The moon was just dropping to its bed in the sea. It and the stars threw a soft light over the earth. Against the whiteness of the snow, the scene lay in black relief. Their home, furnished by the hunter cannery, perched on a rise of ground some hundred yards above the sea. He could see the, plain, the pale ribbon of trail leading down to the dark bulk of the cannery buildings, the long pattern of the dock, and the outreaching sea. A single boat lay at the dock. It was the cannery tender waiting for the dog, Smile dog Smiley Johnson was flying out. A second trail from the house plunged into a black mass of timber on the right. The trail tre threaded its way through those trees for a mile and emerged at the end of one short street of Copper City. It wasn't really a city, just a collection of houses and a few stores. A half century ago, there had been a big copper mine here, and the town had held a thousand people. The copper ran out some years ago, and the mine was abandoned. So were most of the homes. A hundred or so people still lived there. It should be called Fishtown now, Andy's father said. Everyone who lives here either works in the cannery or s signs during the summer. Andy's father worked in the cannery. The moon dropped into the sea, and Andy knew daylight was an hour or so away. He turned abruptly and slogged off across the tundra. The valley that l uh, held Tan Andy's trap line had been punched into the center of a massive nest of snow-covered peaks. The valley was wide and deep. The floor was sprinkled with brush and timber, ideal for fur-bearing animals. The sides were steep and rimmed with jagged bare ridges. By the time the cold sun broke over the mountains and down into the valley, Andy had taken two muskrats and a weasel. He kept going until the sun told him it was near noon, but he took no more fur. He sat on a stump and ate his sandwiches, then went on again. He guessed he was about halfway over the line. It would be long past dark when he returned home this day. Some time later, he ran on to the lynx tracks. He kept a sharp lookout. A lynx would bring good money, a lot more than all the muskrat and weasels he could take today. He caught another weasel and began to feel good. It should be a pretty fair payday. The next two traps had been sprung. He reset them. The next three had not been touched. The sun was dropping toward the jagged rim of the valley, and the night's cold was beginning to set in when he heard a plane. He stopped and watched it race down the valley and pass over him. It was Swede Eklund's white job. Swede was one of the bush pilots searching for Smiley Johnson. Andy went on, keeping a sharp lookout for the lynx. He took another weasel. There were two traps to go. The next was empty. One more, he, then he could head back for home. He came to the edge of a small clearing, and there was the lynx, moving stealthily into the open from the opposite side. His body was crouched, ready to spring. His eyes were fixed on something straight ahead. Andy raised the rifle and fired. The cat caught the motion and the world. Andy saw his bullet kick up the snow beyond. He shot an inch over the cat's head. In two lightning pounds, the lynx disappeared into the brush. Andy stepped into the clearing, disappointed that he'd missed. Then he saw what the odd-shaped mound of snow covered. There was twisted yellow metal under that snow. He saw half a blade of bent propeller and a broken ski dangled at a grotesque angle. He saw a side of metal and bold black letters, SMI. 
that ended in a great jagged hole. An odd-looking crate with iron bars lay some distance off. He had found Smiley Johnson. For a little while he just stood there, shocked by the realization. A single sh thought kept running through his mind. Smiley almost made it. Two more minutes, and laughing, happily go happy-go-lucky Smiley Johnson would have been safe. Two minutes. Less than five miles. Finally, he looked all about the clearing. There was no sign of life. No human tracks led away from the wreck. The stillness of death was in the frigid air. Andy forced himself to go to the plane. There, he stepped out of his snowshoes and worked his way through the wreckage until he could look through the door's broken window. Smiley was bent double over the seat, sorry, over the wheel as though asleep. He was still strapped to the seat. Without thinking, Andy said in a small, frightened voice, Smiley, a oh, smiley! Then he turned quickly away. He was trembling and felt half sick. He saw the crate, the trampled down snow around it, and and moved that way. He dropped on his knees and looked in at the still form of the wolf-like dog. At first he thought the dog was dead. His eyes were closed, and there was no movement of breathing along his thin sides. Then Andy noticed the flank where the lynx had torn the skin. Fresh blood was oozing from the wound. Andy removed his bit and put his bare hand through the bars and laid it on the dog's head. He was not sure he felt warmth. He ran his hand down the muzzle to the nose. There was warmth there. The dog was alive. But Andy had seen enough in a year and a half and a half of tra trapping animals to recognize the gray look of death. He sat back on he heels and studied the dog critically. So this was the lead dog of the team that had won the North American Sled Dog de Derby at Fairbanks. He didn't look much, like much now. Andy knew he'd have to start back immediately and tell his father what he'd found, but he couldn't leave the dog here like this. Night was coming on. By the time he reached home and his father would get a party together to come up here, it would be tomorrow. Tomorrow morning. The dog would never live that long. He'd die, or some wild animal, wild animal like the lynx, or that pack of wolves that was running the ridges every night, would somehow get at him and kill him. It would be better to put the dog out of his misery before he left. Andy thought of the dog dying helpless and injured, trapped for three days in the cage. At least he should die outside, free once more. Andy smashed the padlock with his belt axe and opened the cage door. He reached inside, carefully turning, turned the dog, and slid him out head first. Then lifted the rifle, placed the muzzle against the dog's forehead, and drew back the bolt. He was about to pull the trigger when the dog's eyes opened and he looked at the boy. The blue eyes of the boy and the yellow ones of the dog studied each other. His, eyed, his eyes held the boy's with as direct a gaze as Andy had ever known. Scarcely realizing what he was doing, Andy tilted the rifle muzzle away and eased back the bolt. As though that was what he had waited for, the dog's eyes closed. Andy watched for them to open again. Then he realized they weren't going to. He knelt there, trying to decide what to do. Until a moment ago, the solution had been simple. Then he had looked into those yellow eyes and was no longer sure. Maybe the dog had a chance to live. If he did, he deserved it after all he'd been through. Andy decided he'd have to take the, jog the dog home with him. That would be a real job with some five miles of deep snow to plow, plow through. He'd need some sort of sled to put the dog on. Andy studied the, cl the cold sky, gouging the daylight he had left. About another hour. It would be very late when he got home. He better face the prospect that he might become too tired and have to spend the na night out. In sub-zero weather, that was a thing no one deliberately did. He'd never done it, but he was sure he could. He had plenty of matches and his rifle. Maybe the dog will die on the way home anyway, he thought. If he does, I'll just leave him. His mind made up, Andy's thoughts turned to something he could hold the dog on. He didn't want to, but he returned to the plane and began searching through the wreckage. He found a four-foot wing tip that had been torn away. It was light and would make a good sled. Now he needed straps or rope to make the a harness for himself and to tie the dog on. Um, there might be some inside the plane. Andy wrenched the door open and crawled inside. He made his way to the back carefully, keeping his eyes from the still figure in the seat. There he found a coil of rope. Andy cut holes through the thin aluminum wing and thread the rope through. He made a loop big enough to slip over his shoulders and across his chest. He pulled this makeshift sled to the iron cave. Cage. The dog opened his eyes briefly as Andy carefully worked the animal's body in, onto the sled and tied it with ropes across the shoulders and hips. With the dog secured, Andy took up his rifle. He worked with the rope sorry, he worked the rope across his shoulders and chest, leaned into the loop, and began the long, slow miles home. At the end of the first quarter mile, Andy knew he had tackled a bigger job than he'd thought. The snow was deep, and though the wing section slid easily enough, the dog was heavy. The pale sun fell behind the ridges, and night spread swiftly across the land.
The moon came up and the stars were bright, casting an eerie light, soft light over the snow in which the boy could see a surprising distance. Andy continued his slow pace back down the valley, stopping to rest only when he could go no farther. At each stop he went back, knelt beside the dog, and stroked his head and spoke to him. Several times the dog opened his eye yellow eyes, briefly. Andy's stops became longer and oftener. After several hours he realized he hadn't the strength to get home. He'd better look for a place to spend the night before he was too tired to get a fire going and drag up enough wood for the long hours ahead. He found a spot some minutes later against a downed tree. At the big end of the tree he kicked the snow away to make a hollow to start a fire. He gathered dead limbs in the nearby brush and dragged them up. With his belt axe he chopped an armload of silver sorry, an armload of sliver sliver from the side of the tree. Luckily he had cut into a pocket of pitch. The pitch flamed up with the first match, and he carefully added chips. He broke up the limbs and fed them into the flames until the fire was big and roaring. Then he pulled the broken wing with the dog close to the log. The, uh, the heat hit the log and bounced back. It made a small pocket of warmth in the freezing cold of the night. Andy loosed the ropes and felt the dog's nose. It was hot and dry. He guessed that the dog had a fever in it and hadn't had a drink for several days. Andy packed his handkerchief with snow and held it close to the heat and let the melting snow soak the handkerchief. He lifted the dog's head, pried his jaws apart, and squeezed the precious drops into his mouth. The dog could not swallow, and Andy stroked his throat. At last he felt the muscles work once, convulsively. He repeated the pro procedure several times, and each time he had to stroke the animal's throat. Andy gathered more wood and built the fire high. He sat with his back against the down tree and let the heat soak in. He watched the dog closely, hoping the heat would rouse him. But there was no change, and he wondered if his folks were worrying, and guessed they were. He wasn't too worried or disturbed. He had a rifle. The fire was big and warm, and there was plenty of wood. The presence of the dog, even in his present condition, um, wiped out all feeling of loneliness. Sometime later he heard the wolf pack running the barren ridges high above. Their voices came down into the valley in a series of high, savage notes that echoed and re-echoed up and down the valley. Their sound seemed to get to the dog, or Andy imagined that he moved slightly. The boy tossed some more wood on the fire, and the flames leaped up, spreading their light across the snow. He laid the rifle across his knees and leaned over to stroke the dog's head. He said gently, It's all right. It's all right. But he couldn't tell if the dog heard him or not.